Well, I know the configuration of classes is Tuesday, Thursday, and Wednesday, Friday. And I appreciate so much your attendance last Tuesday, but I'm especially delighted that you came back a second time, and you're back here on Thursday. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, one of the goals of this week, of course, is to encourage expository teaching and preaching. And I just trust that uh, as a result of these uh, lectures or these messages, your hearts will be challenged for the Word of God to teach it, to preach it. Today I'd like to speak in a very, very well-known parable. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now this week we've been taking parables that have problems built into them. You say, there's no problem with that one. I understand that one. What's the problem? Wait until we get into it and you will see that there is a huge problem that becomes intrinsic to the interpretation of the parable. Um, I would call this the world's most abused parable because it's so often misused. For instance, I'm sure you've heard sermons like this. It's an allegory. The man who fell among thieves is a lost sinner, and the good Samaritan is Jesus, and they just allegorize it. That's an abuse of the scriptures. That's not what it's saying at all. That doesn't pay any attention to the context. Or perhaps you've also heard uh, secular sociologists See that this is a motivation for good deeds, to help the poor, and so on. Now, that's in there, but that's not the purpose of the parable. What is this parable all about? Now, I'd like to look at this under four headings. First of all, the setting, which is crucial. Luke chapter 10, as you know, it's in Luke chapter 10. The setting is given in verses 25 to 29. Then you have the story, the setting, the story in verses 30 to 35. And then you have the sequel, verses 36 and 37. And fourthly, we're going to look at the significance of the story. So four points. I know normally you can only remember three, but you're brilliant. You can take four. So we have here the setting, the story, the sequel, and the significance. So let's start with the setting. And behold, and when you see behold, it sometimes means surprise. And sometimes it means, now I want to point this out to you. Probably that's what it means here. Now listen. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up. Now the lawyer here is not an attorney in civil law as we think of one today. But the lawyer was a student of the Old Testament scriptures. Especially the law of Moses. That was his work. That's what he did. He was associated with the scribes. The scribes were also writers of the law, but they primarily studied the Old Testament scriptures. So this man was gifted in knowing the Old Testament scriptures, at least in studying them. So he stood up and put him, that is Jesus, the Lord Jesus, to the test. The verb is peirazzo. Now, as you know, the verb peirazzo may simply mean to test. For instance, that's how it's used in James chapter 1. Count it all joy when you fall into very testing. It's the same stem. But then the same chapter in James goes on to say, um, God doesn't tempt anybody. It's the same verb, pirazzo. So sometimes it may mean to test. Sometimes it may mean to probe, to get some fault or failure or to tempt. Now quite clearly here, I take it that this man is testing Christ to find some weakness in him. After all, this man is a lawyer. He knows the Old Testament. And here's this young rabbi, born in Bethlehem, but reared in a little backwater village of Nazareth, who has now set up camp in Capernaum. This is his headquarters on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. And he is a rabbi. What does he know? He's not taught. He doesn't any, have any credentials. What does he know? So he came up to him and put him to the test saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You notice that question is often a number of times by different people. That was a strong question on the minds of these Jews. What shall I do that I may have eternal life? Probably the eternal life looks ahead to the millennium, especially as seen in the resurrection of Daniel chapter 2 and so on. Probably looking ahead at the kingdom. They didn't call it the millennium in those days. It was the kingdom. They're looking ahead for the kingdom. What shall I do? The verb, the, the, the pronoun what is singular. 
Now that could mean a couple of things. It could be, what great, grandiose thing can I do that will guarantee me eternal life? What one act? Or it may be looking at your life as a whole. What will my life look like as a whole that I may have eternal life? Basically, it's looking at works. What shall I do? Well, the Lord Jesus, being the master teacher that he is, turns the question back upon the questioner. Verse 26, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? It literally says, how are you reading it? What, what do you get out of the law? What do you see about it? Well, the lawyer answers. And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. I admire this man. Think of it, all the hundreds of laws in the Old Testament. He distills them down to two. Love God totally and love your neighbor yourself. Now that's genius. You know if you ask a person a question, it goes round and around and around and never gets to the point. He doesn't know his topic. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But if somebody knows the topic, ping, 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 he can give it very succinctly very pointedly. Einstein was a genius, and he gave us the formula E equals MC squared. He didn't fill up a whole blackboard with formulas, just E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the square of the speed of light. Now that's genius, to take something huge and great and distill it down to that formula, which by the way becomes the formula for the atomic bomb and the nuclear bomb, and atomic energy, nuclear fission. All that is based on this little formula, E equals MC squared. And here this man takes the whole Old Testament and distills it down to two, questions, two statements. The first one is Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with everything, totally. Deuteronomy 6, 5 follows Deuteronomy 6, 5. Four. Now, isn't that genius? Deuteronomy 6 5 follows Deuteronomy 6 4, but they're related. You all know Deuteronomy 6 4 is the great Shema of Israel. Every synagogue of every type, for years, for thousands of years, they've repeated this statement Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Ekath, he's one. Now, Deuteronomy 6 5 follows that. You shall love the Lord your God totally. T-A-I, which means think about it. If there's one God, no other God, just one, you owe that God everything you are. You don't diffuse your allegiance between many deities. There's one. And if there is one God and he's God, you owe that God everything. They go together. And the lawyer thought, saw it. The second command is, love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Genius. So the Lord Jesus answers. And he said to him, that is Jesus, the Lord Jesus said to him, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Hold it, hold it, hold it. That's salvation by works. It sounds like, do this and you live. But you have to understand the love of God. Now, what I'm about to say is basic and fundamental. We never initiate love for God. Did you hear me? We humans never initiate love for God. All we can do is respond to God's love. We love him, John says in 1 John, because he first loved us. So when he says, you shall love the Lord your God, he, you are simply referring to your response to the love of God. He's basically talking about trust. You love the Lord your God because you trust him in response to his love for you. You can see it in the preceding paragraph. Look at verse 21. At that very time, he rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, and here we have a bolt out of the Johannine blue, as it has been called. I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and didst reveal them to babes. Now, many years ago, I taught a course in spiritual life, and I gave a certain amount of memory work, and this was one of the passages, only the parallel is in Matthew. I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise, the brilliant, and reveal them to babes, because I wanted to inscribe on the minds of those people that scholarship was not going to bring you nearer to God. Now, I'm for scholarship. Don't misunderstand me. I'm for studying and knowing the languages, etc. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying that scholarship by itself will not make you know God more clearly. You have to have the heart of a babe. Thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Then he goes on to say this. I'm, 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 I'm I'll, I'll beside the topic. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and who the Father is, who the Father is except the Son. Now get this. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Notice it's God that takes the initiative. And we can only respond. So when it says, love the Lord your God, you're responding to God's love. And that was Israel's response. God loved Israel. And he showed great compassion upon them. He magnified himself. And now the response of Israel was to love him. So we're simply responding in faith. Now hear me carefully. When it comes to God, we only respond. When it comes to your neighbor, you take the initiative. You love your neighbor as yourself. You don't wait to be loved. You love your neighbor as yourself. You take the initiative. So the Lord Jesus said, that's right. You do this and you live. As you respond to the, God, the love of God, you're going to love your neighbor. That's why the lawyer asks the question. Look at it in verse 29. But wishing to justify himself, he wanted to look good. Wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Did you, never, did you notice he never says a thing about loving God? Of the two questions, of the two statements, I should say, the two commandments, the one that he refers to is love of neighbor. Why just love of neighbor? Because you can tell how well a person loves God by how he loves people. They go together. In fact, it's interesting. I don't think there's any way you can measure love for God except for how do you love people? I state as a principle, you can tell how well a person's getting along with God by the way he gets along with people. And I would tell seminary students, pastors to be, I don't care how gifted a person is, how skilled a person is, how educated a person is, how successful that person is, if he can't get along with people, for God's sake, for Christ's sake, for the church's sake, and for your sake, don't let him get on the board. He'll tear it apart. Because you can always tell how well a person is getting along with God by the way he gets along with people. And the attorney knew that. That lawyer knew that. So he said, who is my neighbor? Now that's crucial. Who is my neighbor? <laughs> well, if my neighbor is a family, family member, oh yes, uh, I'd give my life for that person. If my neighbor is a loyal friend, yeah, I'd give my life for him. If my neighbor is the person across the street who borrows my tools and never returns them, mm, I don't know if I would love him. Who is my neighbor? So that's the setting. And the Lord Jesus is answering that question in this parable. So we can go through the parable rather quickly. You know it already. So let's look at the story. Jesus replied and said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And now, everybody that was in Israel would know that. Jerusalem is about 2,600 feet above sea level, and Jericho is about 800 feet below sea level. And the distance is 17, 18, 19 miles, just a short distance. And if you've ever been to Israel, you know it's a circuitous route, either going down or up. And it's very rough terrain a place where robbers could use caves to hide out in and so on. It was, it's a dangerous trip. And this man is traveling alone. And we read, he fell among robbers. 
They stripped him, took the clothes off of him, and beat him, pummeled him, and went off, leaving him half dead. He was within inches of the end of his life, lying on that roadway. Now, the first person that come by is a priest. And by chance, Calvinists don't like that. By chance. <laughs> it, it might be better to say, and coincidentally, it just so happened. A certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Did you notice the direction he was going? He was going down. He was leaving Jerusalem. Now, contrary to what most people think, the vast majority of priests did not live in Jerusalem. They lived in surrounding villages. David, the magnificent organizer that he was, divided the priests into 24 orders. In fact, you have one of them named in Luke chapter 1, the order of Abijah. It was one of the 24 priestly divisions. And these priests would serve in Jerusalem one week at a time, twice a year, and also, of course, for the major, major festivals. But they would come twice a year to serve one week at a time. And probably this man had served his week in Jerusalem. He was on his way home to Jericho. That's the probability. And that may explain, that may, capital M, capital A, capital Y, that may explain why he passed by on the other side. He'd get home, and his neighbor would say, Mr. Cohen, because Cohen in Hebrew means priest, Mr. Cohen, where have you been? I haven't seen you. Oh, I've been to Jerusalem. I served in the temple. Oh, you saw the temple. Anybody who's seen the temple, anybody who's not seen the temple, has not seen true beauty. Oh, what a privilege. Let me shake your hand. Oh, don't, don't, don't touch me. Don't touch you. What do you mean? Are you so highfalutin now I can't touch you? No, on the way home, I dealt with a man that had open wounds and had blood. So I'm unclean. <laughs> That's a joke. Here's a priest who had served in Jerusalem and he comes home defiled. Now that may be the explanation. We don't know. But he passed by on the other side. A Levite comes along, as you well know. We read in verse 32, likewise. And likewise a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now as you well know, the Levites were not of the family of Aaron. They were the, of the tribe of Levi, but they were helpers to the priests. They helped the priests. They were of a religious order. They, people paid tithe to the Levites. The Levites took that tithe and paid from it the tithe to the priests. But they were part of the, pre, part of the religious order. And this person of the religious order saw him and passed it by on the other side. It doesn't say which direction he was going. We don't know why. It may be that his wife said, I want you to get home as soon as possible. And he didn't want to make his wife angry. We don't know what it was. It may be he thought it was a dangerous place to be. It may be that he had an appointment. We don't know what it was. But he just passes by on the other side. Now, verse 33, but, de, but, a certain Samaritan, as you know very well, the Samaritans were despised by the Jews, and the feeling was mutual on the part of the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half-breeds. When Assyria moved the northern tribe out of Israel, they transplanted them with other peoples from other nations, and they interbred. So they were half-breeds. That was bad enough. That was not the main thing. The main thing was the Samaritans had set up a rival religion at Shechem. They had their own temple. They had the Samaritan Pentateuch. They had their own rituals, their own beliefs. The Jews despised them. And the Samaritans hated the Jews. And this despised Samaritan comes by. He was on a journey. Now notice that. He had a destination. Probably he had a timetable. He had a time, people, probably, because on a journey. He was on a journey. And he came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. The idea of your guts. You feel it in your, in your belly. Have you ever noticed? You feel your deepest emotions right here, in your gut. Uh, you receive a letter from the IRS. You are being audited for your 2013 tax. Bring all your records, da, 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 da. You feel it right here. You have just won the Clearinghouse, Publish House, Clearinghouse Publishing Sweepstakes. You are receiving $7,000 a week for the rest of your life. You feel it right here. 
<clears throat> and this man was moved with compassion. He felt it deeply. He was moved with the compassion, and he came to him. Instead of passing by, he went up to the person and bandaged his wounds. Have you ever asked yourself, where would he get the bandages? You don't carry bandages around when you travel. He probably tore up his own clothes to make bandages, pouring oil on the wounds. The oil would be for the bruises, to mollify the bruises, and also, we find out, and wine on them. The wine would be for the open cuts to serve as kind of an antiseptic. So he ministered to them physically. Then we find he put him on his own beast, a burden, on his own beast, probably a donkey. And he had been riding that donkey, and now he gets off the donkey. And he, it must have been some effort to get that wounded man up on that donkey. And he himself walked while the wounded man rode that beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Sleepless night. Spending the night just watching over the person. And on the next day took out two denarii. A denarius was generally the equivalent of one day's work for a working man. Just to keep it in round numbers, we could say he took out $200, $100 a day. I'm just saying that as a round number. $200 for a total stranger. And gave it to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. In other words, I'm paying not only for the room rent, I'm paying for you to take care of him. Watch over him. And whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. I'm coming back, evidently. I'm on a business trip. And when I come back, I'll repay you. Now there's the story, very simple story. Now we come to the sequel. Verse 36. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among fell into the robber's hands? Hold it, hold it, hold it. That's the wrong question. The lawyer asked, Who is my neighbor? And we'd say, the neighbor is the man who fell among thieves. That's not the question the Lord Jesus asks. Who is the neighbor? The priest? The Levite? Or the Samaritan? He turns it around. Now, why does he do that? That becomes the problem. And that becomes the answer to the story. Well, you can tell this lawyer hates the Jews, hates the Samaritans so much, he can't even frame the word. Look what he says. And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him, the Samaritan. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. What is this parable saying? What is the significance of this parable? I see three important points. Number one, it's not enough just to see a need. You must do something. And you can tell the Lord Jesus emphasizes that because you have exactly the same participle three times. Idon, idon, idon. And when he saw, take a look at it. Verse 31, and by chance a certain priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, Verse 32, likewise, I leave it also when he came to the place and saw him, when he saw him, and then the Samaritan, when he saw him. Exactly the same verb, the same participle, three times. And the Lord Jesus is stressing the fact it's not enough just to see a need. I marvel at my own hardness of heart. I mean that. I can see a need and say, I have an appointment. My time is precious. I can't stop. I can't do anything here. And I just go on by. And I think I'm on every mailing list for every person that's soliciting funds in the United States. Every day I receive one, two, three, or four appeals for money. And many of them I glance at as I'm throwing them in the wastebasket. Now, I think you have to do that because there's no way I could answer all those appeals. But I could be much more sensitive to genuine needs. It's not enough 
to see a need, you must do something. The second principle is this. What you do is dependent on what you see. Now, we aren't sure of why that priest passed by on the other side. It could be, as I said, a fear of defilement. It could be danger. It could be some other reason. The same thing with the, with the Levite. But what he saw was at least a bother. Could not stop. Danger, whatever it was. What he saw determined what he did. The Samaritan saw a man that was in desperate need. What he did was determined by what he saw. Now, that's not the main lesson. Lesson number one, it's not enough to see a need. Lesson number two, what you do is determined by what you see. This man saw a person that was in need, a neighbor. The third one, and this is the point, what you see is determined by what you are. That's why he turns the question around. Who was the neighbor? Why, the neighbor was the Samaritan because he he saw a neighbor. What you are is determined by what you see. Uh, I worked my way through college in a hardware store. And the department I worked in most of the time was the bolt and screw department. We sold grosses, thousands and thousands of bolts and screws. To this day, I'll look at a machine screw and say, oh, that's a roundhead steel machine screw, uh, 1024. <laughs> or I'll say that's a, that's a, a pan head uh, sheet metal screw, one inch by eight. You just, because that's where I worked. Now, I've studied the Bible a little bit. I mean that. I studied the Bible a little bit. And again, I go back to 1 Corinthians 8. If any man thinks he knows anything, he does not yet know as he ought to know. And I would sometimes say to my students, if you knew how much about the Bible I don't know, you'd charge me tuition to be in my classes. <laughs> There's so much I don't know. There's so much I don't know. But I understand this, that what you see is determined by what you are. And so it is, I would listen to a sermon. Now, I honestly, I say this with all my heart, I honestly listen to the sermon to get a blessing, to receive something out of it. I know that's the heart of the faculty as well. Uh, speakers come to Dallas Seminary, they're intimidated because the faculty is in the congregation or in the audience. Now, I know the audience, I know the faculty, they, they have a heart for God. They want to get blessing out of the message as well. But I can't help it. When I listen to a message, I listen, how is he, how is he interpreting this? Um, how is he developing it? Is he illustrating it well? What's he, you, you just instinctively do that because that's who you are. Let's suppose there are three men in an automobile uh, and you're driving down, he's, they're driving down a country road. The driver of the, of the car is a farmer. Uh, have you ever been behind a farmer driving down a country, country road? He goes at trolling speed. <laughs> you know why? You look at his head, it's over here and over here. He's checking to see how his neighbor's soybeans are doing and how the corn's coming and, and is this, this hay crop, is it ready for, for cutting and, and so on. He's a farmer. That's what he sees. I had an uncle who was a road builder. And let's suppose this man sitting next to the farmer is a road builder. He'll look at how the road is crowned what kind of a surface it has, how is the drainage taken care of, what kind of a, a bank they have on the curves. He, he just, that, and when I was with that uncle, I could see he was just looking at the road to see it was built. And, and the person in the back, see, there's a paint salesman. He sees that Mrs. White's house is going to need painting, so he's going to call on her to sell her some paint. And Joe's barn needs painting. And, and the next farmer has his machinery. He's been outside for two years. He knows that machinery is going to need some paint. So he sees what by what he is. We teach that to our children. Do you ever notice that? Pussycat, pussycat, where have you been? I've been to London to see the queen. Pussycat, pussycat, what well, saw you there? I saw a mouse under a chair. <laughs> now, think about that. Here's the cat, knows exactly where it's going. And he knows why he's going there. He's going to London. 
and the purpose is to see the queen. Finally, those great oaken doors are opened, and there is the queen on her throne in all of her regalia. And what's it the cat see? A mouse. <laughs> because it's the nature of cats to see mice. Do likewise. First of all, respond to the love of God. Because all we can do is respond in simple love and faith. And display that love by loving your neighbor. Even people who are despised. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this magnificent, magnificent, wonderful parable. Work in our hearts so that we not only love you, Father, by your Spirit, transform us. And then because we love you, we love people. Give us a heart for people. May we respond by loving you and reaching out to people. I pray this, Father, from my own heart, just as well as the students and the staff and the faculty. In Jesus' magnificent name, amen.